Pacific greetings, Nimbula Vinaka, Namaskar and Noa'ia. My name is Mariana Wanga and I work as the Ecumenical Enabler for Child Protection and Empowerment for the Pacific Conference of Churches. This morning, it is my privilege to moderate a Thalanoa titled Cradle of the Ocean. A cradle, as many of us understand, is a small bed or rocker that is used for babies to sleep or to rest in. The word cradle can also mean to hold something gently or protectively as precious and valuable items to the one who is holding it. Our Talanoa title is special because it is derived from the word estuary. Have you ever heard of this word, estuary? An estuary describes the area of water where the mouth of a river meets the sea. In other words, this is where the fresh water and salt water mix and combine, forming one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Estuaries offer protection for many aquatic creatures. They are known to be like nurseries for baby fish and all types of other animals before they head out into the wide open ocean. This is why estuaries are also known as the cradle of the ocean. Therefore, part of my task as moderator is to open up a safe space, an estuary for five of our Pacific children and young people to engage in conversations around the meaning, the beauty, the dangers, the protection, the abundance and the poetry of our oceans. Uh, before I um, open this up with a prayer, uh, I would just like to invite um, our participants from Nanuku to unmute their video and if they can please sing their opening hymn of Ongo na Nongumasu. him. So before I introduce our panelists for us today, let us come before God in prayer. Creator God, in the Genesis account of the creation story, it tells how you gathered the primordial waters and upon looking at them, you saw that it was good. Later, you would fill the waters with the great creatures of the seas, and you command, commanded that they be fruitful and increase in number. Here in the Pacific, the ocean is the livelihood of many of our peoples. We source our food through fishing. We allow our children to play amongst her shallows. We use the ocean to bridge distances between our loved ones. And through our storytelling, we remember the ancestors whose reliance and reverence of the ocean allowed them to be embraced in a deep knowing of her waters. Lord, this morning we have five of your precious children seated and waiting to partake in this webinar. I pray that you will fill each one of them with the courage to participate and share what is on their hearts and give them clarity of mind 
and the confidence to speak up and share their thoughts and experiences. Remembering Jesus' radical call of his time to let the children come to him, we too follow this example by bringing together the five whom you have chosen and acknowledging that their presence, their voices, and the wisdom gifted to each one of them will pour forth as we reflect, lament, and celebrate Oceans Week. Help those of us listening to do so with the intent of hearing with an openness of heart, spirit, and mind, as we cradle the future and hope of our island nations through invitation of your most precious gifts, the children. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing five amazing young people who will partake in our fellow North celebrating Oceans Week. First, we have 16-year-old uh, Melaya Naikau Tusulu, who hails from the village of Kanavea Vuna in Taviuni with maternal links to Tailevu. Mela is currently a year 12 student at St. Joseph's Secondary School and, and is undergoing a diplomacy training at the United Nations Associations of Fiji. She has also recently been appointed to the Children's Advisory Team under the Child Right Connect base in Geneva, Switzerland. Mela is also the vice president of her local church youth group and takes an interest in many things especially around the areas of socializing and learning. Her talents include baking and singing, and she also partakes in youth activities with her church and interfaith groups. In addition, she strongly stands and advocates for child protection, safeguarding, and having safe spaces for children. One value that she tries to live by every day is tactfulness. Tactfulness, in her own words, simply means keeping a good sense of mind when saying or doing something. She also adheres to this value as it evolves around the consideration of other people's feelings and perceptions. Second on our uh, panelists, for our panelists, we have uh, Ms. Anne-Marie Randuva, who is a 17-year-old 17, 17 Fijian environmental and climate activist. She is an advocate, influencer, eco hero champion, and founder of Young Eco Champs Fiji, a network of youth dedicated to healing our deteriorating planet through advocacy, campaigns, action, sustainable practices, and the Say No to Balloon Releasing Fiji. In her effort to raise awareness on carbon emission and coastal rehabil rehabilitation, and Mary and her young supporters have planted more than 30,000 mangroves along the Suva foreshore. Anne Mary is a year 12 student at St. Joseph's Secondary School in Suva. And in 2020, she became the first Fijian to be the United Kingdom High Commissioner for a day in Suva. She is also the recipient of the notable Eco Hero by the Action for Nature 2019 International Young Eco Hero Award, which is an international non-governmental organization that is based in the United States. Third, we have Miss Antonia Bagwan, who is 15 years old with paternal links by adoption to the village of Nodo in Rewa and maternal links to the village of Lomanikoro, also in Rewa. Antonia is a year 11 student at Yatsen Secondary School and she swims for the Dolphin Swim Club and likes to draw, paint, and write poetry. Fourth on our panel, we have Alosio Sovita, who attends John Wesley Primary School. Alosio comes from Vuna Taviuni with maternal ties to Naudiwai Kandavo. He is the head boy of his school and represents the under 15 rugby team for John Wesley. His hobbies include playing the guitar, watching movies and riding his bike. And finally on our panel, we have Varani Sese Vanawa Tangi Dakimbao, 
who is 13 years old and hails from the village of Lamiti in Ngao, with maternal ties to Toko village in Ovalau. Varani Sese attends Marsland Primary School and is, a, and is a school representative for the under 13 netball team. She is also an avid reader and senior member of Unilangi Book Club, where she helps read to her younger peers and translates stories from English to the Itauke language. So ladies and gentlemen, they will be our panelists for today. And just a brief message to our young panelists. I want you to take one deep breath in and one deep breath out. Okay, this is a safe space for you to all participate in this conversation. It's a Thalanoa, meaning it's not that serious. The, the main thing with this uh, webinar is for, the, for myself and those who are listening, the audience, we need to hear your voices, okay? We need to hear what are your experiences as we celebrate Oceans Week, okay? You have important stories to tell us, important perspectives to share with us, and that is why we are here this morning, is to listen to your voices. So before we begin, um, I am going to start off with a story. Um, this morning, we are going to be reading a book titled The Legend of Tanovo and Tautau Molau. Now, um, our history as Pacific Islanders are steeped in oral traditions, meaning that our stories are recorded through word of mouth, through our art, our sculptures, and our artifacts. The story of our oceans are also recorded through our myths and legends, which have been passed down from our ancestors through generation to generation. These stories tell of how our islands and peoples came to be and how the oceans are deeply connected to who we are as peoples of the Pacific. So I'm just going to share a screen with you and I will read you this story. Um, as I read the story, you know, take note of the, the different characters, the drawings, um, and the way that the story plays out itself. Um, at the end of the story, I will ask each one of you uh, what you learned, what you thought about the story, and, um, and yeah, we can begin from there. So the book that I'm about to read to you um, is actually quite special. It's been written by a local author, uh, by Mr. Kaliopate Tavola, um, and he has been assisted by his daughter, Emma Tavola. And the special thing about this book is, not only is it written by a Fijian um, or a Pacific Islander, but the drawings, as you will see when I share screen with you, have actually been drawn by the very young children of Ndravuni village in Kandavu, which is where um, the story I'm going to be reading to you, it's actually the, the, the legend of how the islands in Kandavu came to be. Um, so let us begin. Okay, the legend of Tano, Tanovo and Tautau Molau, as told by Kaliopate Tavola, assisted by Emma Tavola, and illustrated by the children of Ndravuni Island in Kandavu. A long time ago, there lived two Vuls ancestors with superhuman powers. Their names were Tanovo and Tautau Molau. Tanovo lived on Ului Solo, a big mountain on Ono Island. Meanwhile, Tautau Molau lived on a reef known as Vunilangi, at the foot of Ului Nambukelevu, the highest mountain in all of Kandavu. Tautau Molau regarded Ului Nambukelevu as his own. At that time, Ono and Kandavu were the only islands in the area. 
Tanovo and Tautomulao were equally strong, fearing and respecting each other. But they both wanted to be the best and used many cunning tricks. So there's a picture drawn by the children of Ndravuni. showing the two vores, the two ancestors. One day, the novel crept to the top of Luina and Bukelevo with two Vesa Vesa baskets. He filled them with soil and rocks to take away. He was filled with envy that Tautau Mulao's mountain was higher than his own. Suddenly, he saw Tautau Mulao speeding towards him. He had been caught. The novel quickly gathered the two Vesa Vesa Shoulders, shouldered his imbalewa, yoke, and ran. So there are the two baskets that were filled with rocks and soil. Tautau Mulao chased the novel all the way from the bottom of Uluin Nambukelevu along Bamba Deva, past the shimmering ocean and tall tree lined coast to Ono Island. The two vores ran up high peaks and down deep valleys and crossed lagoons. As the novel ran and galloped to ex escape Tautau Mulao, soil and rocks fell out of the baskets and into the sea. Instantly, small islands were formed. The big creatures of the sea watched in excitement as the chase continued. So what happened here? As Tenovo is galloping away from Tautau Mulao, he's carrying those Vesa Vesa and the soil and rocks are falling into the sea, into the ocean. And it's telling us that instantly those rocks and soil formed into the small islands that now exist in Kandavu. So here are some drawings of what seems to be the big sea creatures watching these two battle it out over in Kandavu. Again, illustrated by the young children of Ndravuni village. Tautau Mulao chased the novel off Ono Island to the Astrolab reefs and into the deep blue sea. Wading through the strong waves slowed them down, but they kept going. Soil and rocks continued to spill from Tanovo's two baskets and more new islands were formed. When the baskets became empty, Tanovo threw the Vesa Vesa into the sea. They became the solo reefs, which are there to this day. His yoke became a solid rock in the middle. So the solo reefs are there if you visit Kandavo. I know one of you is a um, Vasu to Kandavo as well. So if you go there um, and visit the reefs, one of them is called the solo reefs. We, here we have another drawing of the two battling out. No longer carrying the heavy baskets, the novel felt strong and full of energy again. Tauta Mulao, on the other hand, began to feel tired and uneasy. Seeing that Tauta Mulao had weakened, the novel decided to turn and chase him away. Now Tautau Mulao had to run for his life. Tautau Mulao hid behind a big rock near Nakasaleka. The novel grabbed a big stick nearby and threw it with all his might at the rock. It hit so hard that it made a hole forever in the rock. Here we have a picture of the big rock with a stick piercing the rock. Now, if you also know uh, your Old Testament stories, you will know that uh, in the Old Testament, there's also another story about um, a rock being struck. Um, yes. Delta Mulao was now filled with fear. Being a reef dweller, he decided to hide underwater and dove deep down into the sea. But the novel, Feeling very thirsty, drank the sea dry and revealed Tautau Mulao's hiding place. Tautau Mulao did not know where to hide anymore. He felt tired and just wanted to go home. 
He accepted his defeat by Tanovo. In turn, Tanovo agreed that they would not fight anymore. So imagine being so thirsty that you drink up the entire sea dry. There you have the two of them, one hiding behind under the water and the other looking quite thirsty and about to drink the sea dry. The two vuls parted ways and lived separately after that. All this happened long ago, but today in the footsteps of their mighty chase, of their mighty chase we see the solo reef and the many islands near to Ono and Kandavu. Dravuni is one of these islands. So Dravuni Island in Kandavu. Here's a picture of the children. Up here it says Yanu Yanu Sao, Yanu Yanu Sao, Yanu Yanu Iloma, Yanu Yanu Otumba. And then you have Vanua Kula up here and Ravuni Island here. And here is a picture of the solar reefs today. So if any of you grow up and become divers, you can visit these reefs and see the fish and the corals. And here is a picture of Mr. Tavola in Dravuni Island where he had the young children drawing the pictures for this legend. Okay. Okay, so now that the story um, has been told. I hope you enjoyed that reading and more so that you enjoyed the, the beautiful pictures that were drawn by the young children of Ndravuni. Um, now that we've read that, I'd like to know what your thoughts are about what we've just read. Um, what did you learn? What did you think about the story, um, the history that it's telling that's, as we mentioned before, that's coming down from our ancestors through to the descendants, through to our generation. Um, I will begin, I think, I will begin with Anne-Marie. Um, if I can get a response from you uh, regarding the story that we've just read. Hi, um, thank you very much for the, uh, the, the reading. Um, I've just noted down some just some points about uh, Tanovo and Tautau Molau. Um, they were both powerful rules, um, and they wanted to be uh, more powerful than each other. And it also tells us how small islands were formed when um, Tautau Molau chased Tanovo, and when he threw the 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 uh, when he threw the basket, the 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 vessa vessa the vessa vessa yes when that's he right. threw it, thank you when he threw it into the sea it uh, formed the solar reefs and so that's my take on the story thank you thank you Anne Marie um, over to Varani Sese. Um, if I can get a response from you about what you thought of the, the drawings, the story itself. Have you heard anything similar to the story that you've just listened to? What are your thoughts about the story, Vera? Uh, my thought about the story is that um, I could not uh, like believe a Wu can drink the whole sea over there. And he was thirsty and he found uh, Tanovo, uh, Tatamolao. Yes, isn't that incredible? And, and uh, Alosio, any thoughts on the book that we just read? Uh, 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 they, are, they are both powerful. Eh? They want to, they want to be, 
They want to be what? The... Be strong. Be strong. Uh, and, and they chase it's chase each, each other. And when when they throw throw the stick, it forms a hole in the in the rock. Yeah. Yes. How do they throw the stick? Because the stick is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it can that's break. Like yeah, it can break. And the thing goes inside there, forms a hole in a rock. That, that's right, Alucio. That's a great question that you've just asked. How can wood penetrate or hit a rock and actually put a hole in there, right? Because we know if we were to throw a stick at a rock, yes. very hard rock, the stick would break or it would bounce back off the rock. It's gonna break. That's a great, yes, that's right. So just yes. showing how powerful they were, right? Thank you, Alessio and Vara. Yeah. Um, okay, over to uh, Anto. Um, well, it was a very, I really enjoyed the, sorry, I enjoy listening to uh, these myths and legends about how is sorry that's okay how we came to be you know like creations of islands of people i well it's very it's a very old self-explanatory story you know the two vus they fought each other to gain power to be more powerful than each other but uh yeah, I just I just really enjoyed it. I enjoy listening to these stories. That's all. Great. And uh, Antonia, being an artist yourself, what did you think about the drawings that were drawn by the young children of Ndravuni for that storybook? Well, I, I it was so cute, you know. Um, I felt like glad that they were it seemed they were enthusiastic about the story and they wanted to portray that in their drawings, you know? Yeah. Great, thank you, Anto. Um, and finally, uh, Mela, if we can hear from you uh, about the story. Melaya? I think she's having trouble with her audio. Okay. Okay, that's all right. We can um we can come back to Malaya and ask her. Oh, sorry, are you there, Malaya? Sorry. Um, that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, for me, I think the story was great, and uh, the fact that it shared how islands were formed, and especially in Kandavu. Uh, I like the fact that it's been uh. Expo this story has been like exposed and continuously told to you know the to children and uh, yeah because then it'll keep the the culture alive so yeah that's like my thought that's my point of view from the story and the fact that um, the kids from Dravuni village were uh, partaking in the, in the story by drawing uh, by the drawings that's like that's I think that's like really nice because then you know they'll pass it on to the next generations and yeah it'll keep our culture burning and whatnot thank you thank you Malaya and uh, Malaya just on that um do you uh do you think that more of our stories of our oral stories need to be turned into books uh so that our young children can remember these kinds of stories and even like as the Ndravuni children did illustrate um the the pictures to be continued on to the next generation uh, definitely. You... yes i think yeah i think that's a great idea because like especially now as time goes by um you know how westernization is like there's a big you know the global village has like a real big impact on us uh i think through books children will be able to remember and you know treasure these stories of their cultures and how we came to be and you know just keeping things interesting so thank you 
Thank you, Malaya. Sorry. <laughs> um, as uh, as we all know, um, you know, children and young people today are actually situated here in Suva are going through quite a lot uh, with these lockdowns. It's now been seven weeks of having to remain home. You know, there's so many uncertainties happening around us and, you know, the, the um, cases of uh, COVID continue to rise. So begin before we move on to actually speaking about uh, the ocean itself, I'm really interested to hear about how each of you are coping um, in these lockdowns. How have you been feeling? And you know, are, are there have there been challenges that you've um, that you've faced um, during this time? And how are you coping? with the changes uh, in your daily lives. We know that uh, last year there were lockdowns that happened, um, but this year it seems to be, there seems to be an air of more seriousness around this. So I'm really interested in how you're all coping and dealing with um, the current situation here in Suva. Uh, if I can um, ask uh, Anne Murray to, to begin. Um, thank you, um, Mariana. Um, my holidays have been good. Um, uh, just my sister and I are just uh, doing some studies, and uh, we're just. Um, I think the situation in Fiji is really. It's it's really, uh, sad to see that the cases of COVID nineteen is increasing in Fiji, um, but. We are always praying uh, for the families around Fiji so that God can provide them with abundance of food, water, shelter, and clothing. Um, I'm just happy that I'm able to stay home with my family. And you know, these are the cherished moments that we have with each other. And we, during the holidays, we enjoy baking. Um, my dad, my dad, um, we have a session at home where we have Sunday school with my dad and he teaches us um, like some of the God-given responsibilities. And I'm happy that, uh, you know, as a family, we get to sit down together and we get to discuss um, like our plans and we get to pray over our plans and asking God to, you know, like help us and tell us what to do and what not to do. And um, uh, I've also done a lot of Zoom sessions uh, last week and the previous week. And it was interesting to hear other people's views on the climate crisis and also COVID-19. And um, I also have some uh, Zoom sessions scheduled for next week and the following week, which I'm very excited about. And um, I just hope everybody's staying at home and staying in your bubbles and uh, taking care and also keeping safe as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, Anto, how have you? How are you doing during these lockdowns? Uh, well, you know, it's easy to get bored at home, especially when you're not interacting with other people. Yeah. But um, well, I'm I'm very comfortable with being like alone and isolated. Um, I'm with my family, and that's great. We get to see each other a lot more because when everything was normal, you know, when we didn't have this outbreak, we barely got time to see each other. I had a lot of training, and my brother had classes, and my parents were at work a lot, so we would only see each other. And, in the early morning and right in the nighttime. But you know, you can get tired of seeing their faces at home. <laughs> you know? But it's it I'm glad I'm at home though. It's it's good. I'm good here. Yeah. Thank you, Anto. Um over to Varani Sese and um Alessio. How how are you two feeling uh during these lockdowns? How have you been coping and dealing with the changes? 
well, during this COVID-19, we're just doing some activities at home, cleaning the house, uh, and it's a good time for us to, to stay with family. It's like a final time for us. During, when there was no COVID, like, everything was like better than that time. So I like it when it's the COVID time, it's like a family time for us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Uh, Alessio? For me, it's uh, very boring because uh, <laughs> we're not going outside and play. Yeah. So we just stay, in, uh, stay at home and I'm staying with my grandfather and grandmother. Uh, they just, uh, they, they just, uh, told me to do something for, you know, schoolwork uh, uh, that was given from from school. Uh, it is very boring <laughs> because <laughs> I want to go and ride my bicycle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alessio. <laughs> Binaka. And finally, back over to you, uh, Melaya. Um, with the lockdown, I've been dealing with it pretty well. Uh, I come from a big family. Uh, I have a lot of pets. So uh, <laughs> I think that's like keeping me going. Uh, yeah, you know, just communicating because like before the before quarantine, um, you know, we're always like it's either like we're always in school and then once we get home, we do our schoolwork and then we do our own thing. And then the weekends, we you know all we do is rest because we're tired from the week and then back to it, the cycle. So um, I think this has been a really, um, you know, despite all the, all the how do you say like all the yeah the bad things that that are that's going on um yeah this is like the one thing that's keeping me going family time getting to know my siblings more uh and talking to my parents i think it has definitely helped with my with our family communication and yeah thank you wonderful thank you malaya so what i'm hearing from all of you is that um you know even though there's a lot of uncertainties and you know some may be very bored at home, but it's also given us plenty of time to rest and to spend time with our families um, and to be in the safety of our homes. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, um, everyone. Um, I do have um, a couple of questions which I'd just like us to discuss um, this morning. You know, please feel, I, I can see that you, you all seem quite comfortable by now. You know, any nerves that you may feel, just shake it all off. And, you know, again, we are here to listen to your thoughts and your opinions because I cannot stress enough just how important it is for those of us, for the leaders and for those of us who are in this work to hear your voices, to hear your perspectives, um, because, you know, uh, we cannot do this, um, we cannot do the work that we do without taking, taking into consideration the vital and important perspectives that the children and young people bring to the table. So um, I would like to just um, start off by asking, so by stating, so um, as uh, we've mentioned before, um, you know, it is Oceans Week uh, that is being celebrated around the world. Um, can, can you please share with me what about the ocean, what the ocean uh, means to you on a personal level or to your families or, you know, how do you understand the ocean and, um, you know, this is also an opportune time that if you have written poems or written something that you would like to share with us this morning, um, this will be the oppor opportune time to do so. So the question again, um, can you each share with us uh, what the ocean means to you and your families? Uh, I will ask, uh, I will ask Anto to begin um, with her response. Uh, well, I wrote a poem to answer that <laughs> question. Wonderful. The ocean, it's love, love in its purest form. It was my first love, burrowing itself into my soul and watching from a distance as I grow. The water is still in the early morning. The paddle in my hand rips through the water like scissors tearing through paper. The air is still as the ocean breathes salty gasps and the orange glow of the sun hides lazily beneath the horizon. 
The endless darkness of the sea brings silent company. I could write for hours merely about the beauty of the sea and it still would not be enough. It was poured out by the hands of God and embraces us from every corner of the earth. There's nothing more enchanting than the cloak of blue and those who live beneath it. There's an endless world that hides underneath the guise of the ocean. I was born from the ocean, from its love. The depths fashioned a body of skin and bones, sung a song of humanity into my newly formed ears. The waves carried me to the shore with soft whispers of love and brought me into this world. It is so easy to forget love, to forget how to love. In that same way that love slips through the gaps in our memories, the gaps that are occupied with human greed and selfish, pitiful desires, our plaguing and decaying humanity, the ocean has slipped from our minds. The sea foam and waves are my spirit. I sit and watch the world around me, a world that claims to care for me and nurture me, a world that I have belonged to ever since I was washed ashore by the tides of change. The world has poisoned my spirit. It has been fed by the hands who steal and hoard up wealth without knowing whose it'll finally be. These hands have fed the ocean with poison. The ocean is neglected, neglected by those who feed off it like hungry parasites. We are insatiable, we are insatiable but it is suffering. It is poisoned by the oil we spill and blood we shed in the name of money and greed. All we do is take and take and take. We exhibit no restraint. We are thieves stealing under the lie of sustenance. The ocean does not say anything. It is quiet and brave that we do not know that it is suffering. We have not killed the spirit of the ocean just yet, but it haunts me all the same. People will come and go, faces blending into an unrecognizable mass. They may claw at your skin and turn to dust, but the world keeps turning. The sun will rise and fall, and in the same way, the tide will rise with the moon and fall past the shoreline. The ocean has been there since God opened his eyes and will be there until the earth caves in on itself by his word. This same ocean has guided my ancestors under the watch of the stars. We are the people of the stars and we are the people of the ocean. I breathe in the sharp, salty air, the same scent that those before me have inhaled. The, there are echoes of thoughts that dig into my body and scar my still developing skin. I have hurt and fallen apart under the eyes of the watchful sea. These scars and stretch marks are soothed by the tender but biting kiss of the salt water. The sea tends to me in the same way it has tended to the generations before me, and it will continue to care for the generations after me. It blows kisses through the sea spray and whispers encouragement and reassurance to me as waves curve into the shore. Amalo como se avese la anima. Ask you to love as if it had a soul, for it does and it calls out to us. Its tears make the waves of salt. Its cries crash down hard into the shoreline. I will cry with the ocean. I will swallow their frustrations and scream them out to the night sky. The words of power and poetry melt into an inarticulate garbage and gobble of nonsense. Everybody hurts, so the ocean does too, but it is still there for me. Everything changes and will continue to change, but the ocean does not. It will stay right where I left it. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful um, collection of words, Anto. Um, it really, it really touches on a lot of, um, a lot of themes about the ocean and how, fr from what I'm hearing, just how connected, how deeply connected you feel to the ocean, and that those who have gone before you were connected to the ocean. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to write out that beautiful poem. And I hope you'll continue to write more poems as such. Thank you, Anto. Thank you. Um, so next up, I am going to ask uh, Alosio to share. Now, um, just a, a quick note here. I know that you have all prepared different things, you know, 
please don't feel that you know that you have to present in a particular way as someone else has presented. Um, pr as I've said before, we want to hear from you and the way that you would like to express yourself, yourselves. So I am going to ask Alucio to now uh, please uh, unmute and um, Alucio, if you can share some of your stories, your experiences um, from within your family and community regarding the ocean, Vinaka. For me, the ocean is my playground. It is somewhere that I love to go and enjoy my spare time. And, it's, and it is somewhere I want to live. It is a method of transportation when I sail my boat across the waters to the destination. Creation of God is, it is a part of the earth's body, body where people are de dependent on it for food. Marine organism needs it for their habitat. Ocean can also be known as area of deep water where environment is unspoiled that is free from harm. Ocean also composes of seas. Seas locate, are located where to land and the ocean next meet. Uh, thank you so much thank you. for um, that description, Alucio. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested. You you come, you've written that beautifully, you, but you also come from a family where there are fishermen, meaning that they go out into the ocean. Um, you know, we've shared that before. They go out into the ocean. It's not that they just, you know, that they're just living beside the ocean, but they actually go out so that you are able to, they're able to fish and to bring in, um, you know, the different types of fish that we all like to eat and lobsters, you've mentioned lobsters, that your grandfather um, often likes to go out fishing to bring in um, different types of fish and marine life. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about um, the story of your grandfather and what he does? Uh, especially, uh, I, I'm staying with my grandfather and my grandmother. My 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 grandfather is don't have yeah, he he doesn't have any job and he's a fisherman. Uh, every every day he goes fishing, not on day uh, but on night time. Uh, uh, he's go he go fishing on cold weathers, bad weathers. Uh, he gets uh he go and gets uh fish, and sell it and get the money. To buy to support me and and to feed my family also. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response, uh, Alocio. It just goes to show that you know here in the Pacific the importance of the ocean. That should something happen to our ocean, you know that it means that the livelihood, the lives of many families, of many children and their parents, and in your case, grandfather, who go out into the sea and, you know, for your livelihoods, that that will be impacted if we do not take care of our oceans. And that is something that, you know, that needs to be heard time and time again for us to remind those in power that should our oceans be impacted, it's the families and the children, such as yourself, Alessio, who, who is very blessed to have a grandfather who sacrifices so much to provide for your family. Um, though it's your lives that will be affected. So Alessio, thank you very much for sharing um, that story about your grandfather with us. Um, it is uh, such a, a, an honor for us to hear um, something as special as that. Um, now we will move over to Melaya. Uh, Melaya, if you can please um, share your presentation with us regarding the ocean. Um, uh, so I've written a few words on what the ocean means to me and how it has been part of my life going journey. When I hear the word ocean, the first word that comes to mind is life. Life in the sense that the ocean is basically a part of our daily livelihood, which is inclusive of our culture, traditions, environmental knowledge, 
economy, and even our basic needs. People of the Pacific have been brought up in such a way that the ocean and its offerings have played a huge role in our mode of survival and even an influence on the molding of our individual characters and communities in numerous, numerous ways. The ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. Adding on to that, about 97% of the Earth's water is from the ocean. Just from hearing these statements, one would be aware that the earth and the many lives it holds are greatly affected by the ocean. Ways that are beneficial adding to human growth and development and welfare of all with earthly species. And sadly, due to climate change, ways that are now endangering many species. The life that the ocean not only holds but gives is far reaching. The many rich resources that it contains that add life to other organisms in the sea and on land have made me recognize the true beauty of the ocean. The ocean has yet again greatly impacted people, most especially people of the Pacific, in reference to the building of our culture through storytelling, environmental knowledge, skills, and exploitation of its resources. This is proof that it even has the power to create bonds between people of a Vanua or place. These bonds between people have been established through the ocean and its ties with all organisms through its various offering, offerings that have built and contributed towards our cultures. This actively demonstrates the daily livelihoods of mostly the Oceania people as our cultures have ties with the ocean. Basically saying that the ocean is influential to a large mass of people, thus solidifying my thoughts on the ocean and how it extensively relates to life not only through survival, but through the molding of, of character. Moving on, I would like to share aloud my thoughts as a young person about the cries of the ocean. This refers to the over exploitation and misuse of the ocean's resources that have implanted greed into people through economical benefits and cravings of luxury. People have failed to recognize the importance of the ocean and how it has given us what we needed to be able to carry out these very actions. The ocean has given us life in terms of food, income, and so forth for survival purposes. And to what do we owe it? Obviously not to continuously take from it, but to care for it as well. To be considerate of our actions as to how it will later affect our oceans, which are the very suppliers of our well-being. Coral bleaching, endangered marine species, ocean acidification, etc. These are taking its toll over our waters due to our very own actions, which is awfully saddening. I have great desire in making people aware of their actions impacting the earth, which allow them to foresee the end results and consequences of their doings toward our seas, whether it is mutual or parasitical. Mutual in a way that refers to, that demonstrates an interdependent relationship amongst the ocean and people, or parasitical in a way that refers to an ocean where humans are living for themselves. You know, um, they live in, they're living off the expense of the ocean and its resources. As a young person, I would say that the ocean is basically a part of me. It has instilled, it has instilled fruitful knowledge within me that has helped me develop into a person that has given me the perception that the creation is that creation is simply beautiful. It has instilled culture and values, and most importantly, it has instilled the love for God's art, his wonders, and all the things he's capable, capable to do, all just by the sight of his creations. Sorry. His creation intrigues me in such a way that constantly reminds me that he is caring and always willing to give us what we need. In my opinion, to look at nature and to take a moment to appreciate it is a way of creating a stronger relationship with God. And since it has been scientifically said that the ocean covers above 70% of the earth, this gives me an indication that there is a greater connection between me as a young Christian journeying through life and the father through any sort of contact with the ocean. Furthermore, as a teenager living in this era, I would like to use my ability to be able to understand children and adults to an earthly advantage in such a way that I can be able to communicate and interact with both old and young people by sharing my integrated thoughts on such issues, inclusive of my concerns for the ocean. 
I would like to do this in the hopes of creating a much more age holistic network of opinions and thoughts amongst communities on this relevant topic, and at the same time, empowering other teenagers to do so. Our oceans are crying, reefs are decolorizing, aquatic creatures are in danger and so forth. I think that more young people should be exposed and educated on such issues to be able to bring about change for the future. On that point, enriching young ones on such relevant topics that evolve around the care for our planet home is of great advantage to all generations, inclusive of the ones to come. This is good as children who are the future leaders are made aware of these relevant issues, thus at an early age, embedding our mindset into these young ones of the importance of our environment, which will therefore create well-educated leaders of the future who will focus on the betterment of how resources are used and sustained. To sum up everything that has been stated so far, I would just like to stress once more that our recognition of the beauty of the ocean is a great thing to be aware of as it brings about life, as said earlier. And to have a day dedicated to the ocean is a huge form of gratitude showed towards creation and what it has to offer. With that being said, happy World Oceans Week. Thank you so much for that, Malaya. Um, indeed, a presentation with so many things uh, regarding the ocean and our connection and relationship um, with the ocean as to whether we protect and look after it or we continue um, in some of our destructive practices. Um, Malaya, I'm interested in with what you've just shown um, as a young person, uh, you know, studying research and, and speaking on these issues. I would like to know in a practical sense, you mentioned that you are a youth leader at your church. How do you communicate these kinds of important issues regarding the environment, regarding the ocean with your peers? And do they take similar interests to these issues or is there a need for more awareness, um, more peer to peer awareness regarding um, the plight of our environment and our oceans? Um, well, due to the current lockdown, uh, we are we're currently like not able to get in touch with each other. But um, we've uh, participated in uh, a few um, awareness programs and uh, yeah, on the environment. Uh, what is, how do you say it? Uh, you know, uh, the ones that are led by the Columban priests yeah. Uh, especially on yeah on the environment and whatnot and um, yeah we've had a few talks on what the environment means to us uh, yeah and so forth. That's pretty much and and generally speaking, Malaya, do you think that there's a lot of interest from your peers in regards to the protection uh, of the oceans and what it could mean for the future? Um, for, for your future as uh, children and young people seeing what, you know, what's happening currently today. Do, do you think that your peers are as concerned um, as, as you are? Um, honestly, um, I don't really think that they know much about it. Uh, this is why I uh, mentioned that uh, these type of events and these, and the, yeah, these topics should be uh, exposed to more children and yeah teenagers because I don't think that at this time they are like really focusing on such topics you know they're busy in their own worlds as kids and yeah just trying to you know live about with today's society and what it has to offer so I think yeah I don't really think that they are concerned about it as much I don't really know but uh, that's just my assumption based off what I see and what I feel Thank you, thank you, Malaya. Um, thank you for your presentation. And um, we will now move back over to uh, Nanuku um, for a response from Varani Sese. Thank you, Vara. Uh, yeah, uh, I wrote a topic to answer that question. Uh, the cry of the ocean. Oh, hear me now as I speak. For my future depends on how you treat me Take care of me and I will be at peace. Disturb me, disturb me and I will cause you harm. No one can stop me from moving. 
I cover most of the earth. I am the home of many sea creatures. I am where the humans survive for food and medicine, even build themselves homes. I can be a spot where you find joy, relax, relaxing and peace. Hear me now as I plead. Please take care of me so I may be free. Stop polluting me for I want to also alive. Deep, sorry. Thank you so much, Farah, for that great reading um, of your poem. Um, Vera, you know, we, we've had conversations um, before about you, you live in a community which is very close to the ocean there in Nanuku. Can you please describe to us, uh, to the rest of the panelists and I, um, how, how the, the ocean impacts your community there in Nanuku? So what I've experienced about the ocean is that when we pollute uh, the ocean, it can treat you back what you have done. So when you pollute the ocean, for example, flooding, the flooding in here in Nanook is increasing as, as it was increased. We had to stop it and we had to clean our compounds again. And plus, when when you leave your compounds dirty, it brings mosquitoes, which which drinks our blood and also can kill people. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. So just um, reiterating some of your thoughts that when we are polluting our oceans for our coastal communities, what happens is our pollution goes out into the sea, but then the tides bring them back towards the land, not necessarily to where you might live, but it could possibly come back to places, coastal places like Nanuku. So as Vera has just yes. shared with us, you know, for the children in Nanuku, part of their daily, if not weekly routine is when the tides come into the place, they need to go and clean up their yards, pick yes. rubbish on it. You know, uh, so, some of us, we go out and we collect rubbish on the foreshore every now and then. But for children living in communities like Nanuku, it's a daily reality. You know, depending on how the tides come in and out of the community, it is the children who are having to go and collect those pieces of rubbish, of plastic bottles and so forth, and find places to, to put them away in. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that um, with us, Laura, and uh, also regarding oh, the flooding. The, yes, go ahead. And uh, one more thing about that, um, when flooding increase, and plus when it's like time for school, early in the morning, sometimes we have to cross those flooding, uh, those dirty flooding coming onto us. Well, we have to wait for the water to go down for sometimes, and then we have to go to school for, and then when we reach school, we are, sometimes we'll be late. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, Vara. So that it just goes to show the, you know, that although we celebrate celebrate our oceans, you know, it's Oceans Week and so forth, but there is this other side to the conversation. What we are, what we humans are doing to damage our oceans, which all always comes back to affect us. And in this case, for the children in Nanuku, you know, imagine having to walk outside your home and the area where you're supposed to walk on is flooded. You're going to be late for school. You know, what happens when you get to school and your shoes are wet or your socks or your uniform is dirty because you've had to trek through some water uh, just to get an education and in a city, um, a big city like Suva. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that uh, with us, Vera, uh, sharing your experiences um, there in Nanuku Vinaka. Um, and over to you, final, uh, our final panelist, uh, Anne-Marie, if you can please um, share with us some of your thoughts about the ocean. Um, thank you. Um, before I start with my, um, uh, my uh, talking points, I would like to thank the panelists for their inspiring and um, their experiences. Uh, with the Talano about the ocean. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your stories. Um, for me, my mother speaks about 
you know, her childhood memories filled with family trips to the reef at low tides, um, trying to uh, forage for sea urchins, edible seagrass, or nama in Fijian, clams, crustaceans, and other edible seafood. And she also talked about traditional knowledge that were passed down from one generation to the other, the songs, chants, and stories that would later send me picking up rubbish at the Suvo foreshore during school holiday. Um, but sometimes when I have my, my, my time alone with my two younger sisters, we always talk about, um, you know, their experiences, my parents' experiences about the ocean during their time. You know, it was filled with abundance of fish, um, you know, all our favorite seafoods. But now it has changed and it has involved changes such as warming waters, over harvesting of seafood, pollution, unfamiliar fish stock migration, sea level rise and climate related impacts on fishing. And we always talk about those changes, how it really it destroys our oceans. And we Pacific Island people, we depend on our oceans for food. It's a, it's a source of food. And, and I think it's about time that we young people are taking a step forward and we are telling the adults of today that we are cleaning up the mess that we did not create. And it is about time where we think about our God-given responsibilities in looking after the resources that he has created for us. And, um, and these memories from, from our ocean stories have led us all here, which I am, which I am honored at this specific moment where, where we um, advocate for a more healthier ocean and the communities and the wildlife that really depends on it. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Anne-Marie, for the, uh, that reflection um, with quite um, important um, themes to it. Um, you know, the memories uh, that our parents and our grandparents have of the ocean is, is quite different to what we are faced with, what your generation is now faced with. And in many ways, uh, Anne-Mary, uh, what you're saying is, is true um, in that it, it, there is a sense of unfairness um, in all of this, that those who have not contributed towards the damages that have taken place are now having to find solutions to protect our oceans. Um, so thank you very much for that reflection, um, Anne-Mary. Um, I do have a question that is coming through uh, from our audience, um, and I hope you can all see the place where you can put your hand up, because uh, what I'll do is I will ask the questions, and then if you would like to respond to these questions, please put your hand up, um, and again, be open and um, uh, willing to share whatever it is that is on your heart and on your mind. Uh, so the first question that I have here is, so all of you um, have done beach cleanups where you've gone, you've collected rubbish um, along the foreshore, along the rocks, and you've seen the amount of pollution that is actually out there. Um, the question is, when you do those uh, rubbish collections, what have been your thoughts about the things that you actually picked up, the kinds, the kinds of rubbish that you collected um, from the foreshore? And what are your opinions about the way that we, uh, I, I mean, we can speak for ourselves here in Suva, what are our habits of disposal? Like, what do you think about the habits of our disposal as people living here? Um, are there ways that we can do better? You know, how, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, and please put your hand up and we can give you the, give you the mic to speak. Okay, uh, Anne-Marie. Um, I, I think um, a, a lot of people 
are disposing their rubbish carelessly. Not all, but it's just a few. A few people are disposing their rubbish carelessly. And sometimes when my family and I go for uh, morning beach cleanups, um, we also find plastics, commonly plastics, styrofoams, and also bits and pieces of balloon fragments. Mm. And and early at early 2018, I started advocating for total ban on balloon releasing because um, when when we release a balloon you know, what goes up must come down. So when the balloon fragments are on the ocean surface, it resembles food to our marine animals, turtles, fish, dolphins, seabirds. And once they eat it, it can block the, the animal's gut and causes it to starve. And um, I think people should be more responsible about how they dispose their rubbish. And... Uh, I think if we can work together, all work together, I think that the pollution rate in Fiji will decrease. Thank you. Vinaka and Marie for your response. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll ask for a response from Nanuku because we just mentioned about you know, uh, the ways that the, the, the tides bring in the rubbish from the sea um, into your community. So Alusio and Varani Sese, what are your thoughts about the way, um, about the things that you find, you collect uh, when, the, when the tides bring in uh, the pollution? What kinds of things do you find? Um, and how do you dispose of them? Where do you put the rubbish, you know? Um, and also, what do you think we can do better uh, to keep um, our oceans clean, especially within um, communities that live uh, by the sea? Thank you, Vera and Alusio. So, thank you. My experience about, uh, about that, when we went to pick up rubbish in uh, Utunialo, we saw that there was a lot of rubbish and we had to go in a group, group by group. And when we had to pick up rubbish, we mentioned that when we had to pick up one small type of rubbish, it can also kill uh, marine resources. So we started picking up rubbish. And uh, so finally we were picking up rubbish and we we gone up to a diaper group. A diaper group, yes. they thought they, they won't find a diaper in Utunila, Utunialo. Mm -hmm. So finally, they had to dig the, the dig sand. the sand. And uh, then uh, the they find that they put the diapers under the sand. So they have to pick it up again and put it in the rubbish bin. So I think um, for us, from now onwards, we have to try not to not, not to be care careless and uh, to pollute our environment and our precious ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Um, that's right. The two of you participated uh, in a beach cleanup last year with the Utonialo Trust. Um, you you mentioned, you know, that you found lots of diapers along the foreshore, and um, the the different types of um, the different items, uh, even along the rocks. Um, what do you think? What do you think we can do better? Um, in our own homes, first and foremost, to help keep rubbish out of the sea. There you go. Uh, just pick the, just pick up the rubbish and put it in the bin. Don't, don't just uh, litter it in anywhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alessio. Okay. If there are no other responses to that question, uh, I do have a second question here. Um, and it'll be really interesting to hear from all of you for this one. Um, and this is probably our final one for this morning uh, because we are coming 
to the end of, oh, sorry, Pao, um, Melaya, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to add um, on how I feel about the disposal. I think it's really saddening. And uh, I just wanted to bring to notice the mindset of people, you know, how, um, oh, so like when we went to the foreshore and whenever we clean up, like the amount of rubbish and like the different types of things you see, you know, the things we never imagined to see in our seas, we find there. And I just wanted to, yeah, bring to notice um, the mindset of how people think, oh, it's just a small wrapper, you know, it won't, it, there's no big deal, it won't harm, you know, the resources or the sea or anything. Uh, little do we know that these little things, all our actions, you know, have consequences. And the fact that majority of people have the same mindset of, oh, it's just a little thing, it won't, like, you know, it doesn't matter. Because of that, the, we, of, because of that mindset, we, um, we fail to recognize the the majority of people that are doing this, and because of that, it's all adding up, and it like ends up polluting our seas. And yeah, I just wanted to stress that 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 mindset that mindset should be you know gotten getting um, should be how do you say rectified. And yeah, that's what I think. And in terms of disposal, I think people should um, parents should um, teach their children and their families on recycling and, you know, separating rubbish and what, you know, just proper ways of disposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Malaya. Um, you've touched on a very important point there, the changing of mindset. Sometimes when, um, when we become adults, the kinds of habits that, or knowledge that we've acquired from childhood, it just becomes second nature to us. So if you're someone who has littered your whole life, you know, you're going to continue unless you, you make a conscious, um, a conscious decision to change that, then there's a possibility to change. This is why it's so important that we have young people and children such as yourselves, who from a young age are able to, or you don't, you don't have to change your mindset at a later stage. These are things that you children are advocating on. You're speaking about your perspectives and your experiences. And so you are able to actually impact on a generational level, which you all are uh, to, one, to, some, to one degree or another. So thank you for that response, uh, Malaya. Um, over to Anto. Uh, yes, I've seen a lot of uh, questionable things during these cleanups. Once I saw, you know, one of those mini cars that they buy like they make for kids and like they sit in you know those, yeah that they're like big mm -hmm. yeah um well other there are areas not just in like the urban area like suva but in rural communities and they don't have uh rubbish collection systems or they have irregular collections so people don't really have a choice other than to just dump it and dump their rubbish in rivers and creeks which will just end up in the ocean. Uh, well, they don't um, have any other options, but uh, but they are either that or they are not aware of the other options, you know? So I feel like the government should work to find or create systems for these rubbish collections because it's their responsibility or at least, you know, put more effort in to raise awareness, I guess. Thank you for that uh, response, Anto. Uh, that is very important. And I'm glad that you've brought up the agency that young people and children have, um, even in this day and age, to speak to positions of power, to call upon governments to make these changes that need to be made so that um, the solutions that are being brought up by uh, children and young people such as yourselves can be heard um, at a higher level. Um, we hope that these, uh, that government and other people in positions of power continue to provide spaces so that young people such as yourselves can advocate and can provide the solutions um, to some of the problems we face as a nation and as a region. Um, okay, so we are coming to the end of our session, but there is one more question. Um, and it'll be good if we just get some uh, responses uh, from the panelists. So this question is coming from our, um, our sorry, Varani Sese and Alessio, do you have your hand up? 
You want? Did you want to? No. Okay. Okay. So we do have yes, another question. Yes. Oh yes. Go ahead, Vera. Vera. Um. Uh, uh, going back to the, the question that you asked it, about the speaking of prohibition, the discourse. Of, yeah, uh, I just want to say something that uh, uh, when we when we went to the speaking up uh, campaign in the Utunyan, I learned something that uh, when we pollute the sea, uh, it kills the uh, sea resources. For example, turtles. They they do eat the. Uh, 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 Jellyfish, yeah. When uh, when we when we put uh, plastic in in the sea, they thought that it is a jellyfish, and when they eat it, they will die. So we should uh, put the uh, rubbish carefully. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Alusio. And you are indeed correct that uh, many of our marine life, uh, marine creatures, mistake um, plastic bags or uh, pollution for food, um, and it ends up uh, killing them. Um, just quickly, Alocio, in terms of the pollution, um, with, with the, the men in your community, uh, for instance, your grandfather who goes out into the sea, um, have they mentioned whether they see a lot of pollution when they go out fishing? Do they come across rubbish or? things like that uh, when they grow up. Have you heard anything like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, they, that when, when, they, when they went out for fishing, uh, especially when they, when they caught a fish, when, when in the morning when they come and give the fish to us to, you know, put out the thing in their stomach. Yeah, we saw, uh, you know, plastics and the rubbish inside, they, they ate it. Yeah. So, so some of the fish that your that the fishermen bring into the community when you're when you're gutting it or cleaning up the fish, you actually see small pieces of plastic inside the fish, meaning that the fish has thought it's food and it's eaten it, um, and you find it in its stomach. Thank uh, thank you for um, your response, Alusio, and that's something that you know. Uh, it's very important for us to continue continually take into account that when the scientists and those who work in the ocean are telling us that we are beginning to eat the pollution that we put out there into the sea, for those who are actually working in the sea, the fishermen, those who are in there every day and night, that these are realities that they're actually be be beginning to come across and that children, um, such as those who live in Anuku, are already be beginning to see the impacts of that. So thank you, uh, Alusio, for that. Um, before we finish today, there is one more um, question that has come from our Facebook audience. Now, this question actually refers back to the story, uh, the myth, the mythical story that we spoke about, uh, the legend of Tanovo and Tautau Molau. Um, so referring to the story that was read, the stick, which Alosio, you brought up uh, earlier, caused a hole in the rock. Uh, Alosio, you mentioned that the stick was weak, but was able to make a hole in the rock, right? Um, can you identify some weak things, some weak things, that cause great impact in the ocean? And what is your advice to your friends out there and to the nation? What are some, so we know, we've, we've heard today uh, during some of the presentations, you know, um, that the ocean is a powerful, powerful thing. You know, it can, it's very powerful. We heard about um, in the legend of Tanovo and Tautau Molau, you know, they, they, these two powerful bulls that, battled it out and chased each other, but still, you know, they, they were able to move around. These two powerful beings were then able to move around in the powerful um, area of the ocean, right? So what, so even though the, the ocean is very powerful and has the ability to destroy us, to, you know, to do all sorts of things to us, what are some weak things 
okay, weak things that can cause great damage or impact to the ocean. What are some things, not only weak, but even small things that, you know, we've heard some um, comments um, from Malaya about, you know, small little rapids, lolly rapids. But when, once they start to accumulate, they, they, they can be very destructive to the environment. So in your thoughts, what are some weak things that can greatly impact the ocean? And what is the advice to your friends and to the nation um, about taking care of our ocean? Uh, I'll get a raise of hands for this one as well, please. Think a little, have a think a little, and then, uh, you, oh yes, Anto, we can begin with you. Um, so one, like, one thing that, I've, that I'm aware about is something so small that I, it's easy to forget about it was like the threads the synthetic threads in our clothes like when we do our laundry and we wash it'll go into the drain into the sewage system and eventually then we'll go back to the ocean so these like the threads they end up in the stomachs of the marine life like you i heard from someone i think it was my father or someone that they opened i heard they uh kai they caught some kai and they opened it up and they saw the threads from the clothes in the kai and so we just really need to be aware of because aware of our actions we don't really there's something so small you know so mundane washing our clothes that we don't realize that it has an impact on the ocean even the detergent we use is harmful to the ocean as well yeah, so all, it just we just need to be aware and try and figure out some alternatives or solutions to that. Mm. Thank you, Anto, for that um, for that response. Um, you know, just even speaking about the kai and finding threads in there. Um, you know, imagine for that if this if your generation is beginning to see these kinds of impacts. Can you imagine two, three generations down from us, what the children will be experiencing at that time? Um, and to, with, with what you've just shared, you know, things like washing our clothes, uh, even the down to the detergent, the chemicals that are in our detergents to keep our clothes clean. Um, have you taken time to, ref to reflect on what kinds of solutions, you know, may be possible? Um, even if it's not technologically possible now, we, we might not have the technology or, you know, it can either be, we might not have the technology now, or even if we look back in the past, how did our ancestors live and, um, and connect and have that relationship with the environment around them so they didn't damage um, the environment? Have you ever had um, time to reflect over what the possible solutions could be? Uh, well, we didn't really have this problem in the past because we didn't really wear clothes, you know? <laughs> so, well, I'm not really sure of what we can do as a solution as of now, but yeah, it's, yeah, it, it is a big question. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, my yeah my point is you know as as we're partaking in this uh, discussion, you know as as young people you know begin to um, to to reflect on what kind of ideas innovations um, can we come up with to better the generation that will come after ours. Um, you know Anne Marie has um, mentioned how she has advocated you know, with um, uh, regarding the issue of balloons and um, not letting it damage our environment. So, you know, as young people, you know, you have the brain, you have the, the intelligence and um, the, the innovative um, gifts 
to come up with solutions as well. And so I really look forward to in the future to seeing where you all are uh, and the kinds of solutions you bring to the table. Um, okay, thank you very much for that, Anto. Um, over to you, Malaya. Um, Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, so yeah, when I think of that, like when I heard the question, when she's, um, wh whoever asked, when they per that person brought up the word weak, um, the first thing that came to mind was like, um, the little, like literally everything, you know, the little things that we do, how I brought that up, I, how I brought that up earlier, uh, that includes like, uh, lead, going back into like our, the improper disposal of stuff. Um, I would just like the first thing that came to mind was like, you know how we have um, we burn plastics and tires and whatnot. Yeah, those the gases emit into the emit into the atmosphere, you know, and then from that it results into global warming. And then because of that, you know how our marine life um, they have they adapt to a certain temperature in the ocean, and because of the rise in the average temperature, these um, it's causing the coral the yeah, our coral reefs and the marine life living in it to die and, you know, causing the biodiversity to lacken. And um, because of that, you know, I'm just like, I just want to stress that everything leads, you know, everything is interconnect, interconnected. So yeah, just our little actions and to be mindful about it. I think that that needs, that m many people need to adhere to that thought. Thank you. Thank you so much for your response, uh, Melaya. Just reminding us again that our collective actions, uh, as small as they may be, um, eventually they lead into big impacts uh, on our oceans and on our environment. So even just throwing that little lolly wrapper to the side and not taking the time to find a bin and put it inside properly, those things collect and they continue, continue to uh, damage and harm um, the environment we live in. So thank you so much for that, Malaya. Uh, anybody else? Uh, yes, Anne-Marie. Um, thank you. Um, global warming is causing uh, sea, level, sea levels to rise, threatening global, um, threatening coastal population centers. Um, I think many pesticides and nutrients used in agriculture can end up in our coastal waters, resulting in ocean yeah. depletion that kills marine plants and sh shellfish. Um, factories and industrial plants discharge uh, sewage or sewage in, and other runoffs into the oceans. And I think we need to stop um, discharging wastes into our oceans because um you know it'll kill our marine animals and you know it also pollute pollutes our oceans and um some yes. other things like oil spills chemical pollutions over yeah. over harvesting um, of seafood destructive fishing and um plastic pollutions thank you Uh, thank you very much um, for that, uh, Anne-Mary, uh, for your responses. You know, um, just um, touching upon what Anne-Mary has mentioned, the destructive you know, fishing practices and so forth. When we're talking about the, these kinds of things, you know, we, we especially address the, the commercialization of, um, of fishing practices where huge uh, organization, uh, organizations, international organizations enter into our seas and just pull out so, you know, so many um, things out of our ocean, you know. Um, so we're, and, and on the other hand, we have our peoples who also go out to fish and to, you know, to live off the ocean. And they have practices, you know, which are, which are able to sustain our oceans and our lands. So when we're talking about these things, what Anne-Marie has just mentioned, it is, it is specifically to those huge corporations 
all sorts of things um, from our ocean, leaving, you know, um, leaving a lot of damage along the way. And it also brings into the question of, if you are pulling all these things out of our oceans, what is going to be left for the children that come after us, for the future generations of the Pacific? So it's very important that, um, that we have conversations around this. Um, I did see uh, Vara and Alucio. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Vara and Alucio, uh, if you can please unmute and um, give your responses. Uh, my experience about uh, the, uh, going to the sea, you know, the, the fishermen, eh? uh, the fishermen, they use a, a kind of a chemical spray to to kill the, the fish. Eh? The advantage of that, they get the fish eh? enough for them, but the disadvantage, uh, they're poisoning the, poison the, the, the marine life. So the solution is uh, uh, we should uh, we should um, use our talent that God has given us, eh? a diving like my grandfather, uh, free diving, eh? get the fish enough to for to feed the family. Thank you. Um, Alessio, thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, you've touched on a very important uh, subject that you know, with all the commercialization, meaning the selling of fish, uh, the trading of uh, our marine life, that these new things have been brought uh, into our countries. And the practice, some of the practices that were pra fishing practices that were practiced before are, are no longer being practiced by some fishermen, right, Alucio? And instead they're using these, uh, what you've just mentioned, the chemicals to kill the fish which is great because you get to bring the fish out of the ocean. But as you've mentioned, it actually, it's so destructive upon the marine life and the waters itself. Yes. So that um, uh, fishermen such as your grandfather who are able to go out there and free dive and, and practice um, fishing methods that have been practiced for many generations um, in your families are able to pull out what they need, but also be looking after the ocean as well. So thank you very much for that response, uh, Alocio. Uh, Vara, did you have something to contribute? Um, well, I just want to share about um, some parts of, uh, what do you call that, um, steel wool. The steel wool, when, when it, sometimes when you put it in the rubbish, sometimes when people use it in out, out of place, like picnic, when they want to clean pots, Sometimes they put it just anywhere in the beaches, and sometimes when when the sea rises, it collects all those rubbish and went through the sea. So while the fish are on the journey, they can sometimes eat it. And plus, uh, the fishermen sometimes they could uh, just catch the fish without knowing that fish is poison or poisonous or no. So when when the when the people eat it, they got poison and uh, they die. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Varani Sese. Um, again, emphasizing that, you know, our actions here on the land um, will eventually come back to harm us again. If we are polluting and doing all these kinds of crazy things to the ocean and not taking care of the ocean and in the environment, not only are they going to be impacted and be affected by it, but it's actually going to come back and not only harm us, but harm the generations uh, to come. So thank you very much, Varani Sese, for uh, that, for your response. Um, look, we are um, at the end of our Talanoa session, but I would like to give this time to um, ask for final comments. In celebration of Ocean Week, you have all done your part this morning to contribute to this Talanoa, uh, bringing in your experiences and your solutions and your ideas. Um, I would like to now give each one of you the opportunity um, to say what, to give one last comment um, regarding the ocean. It can be in celebration of the ocean or it can be a message about the need to protect the ocean, um, but it's over to you now. Um, and so we will, um, we will begin with Melaya. 
um, to give a final comment or response regarding Oceans Week. Binaka Nalaya. Um, to end, I would just like to, uh, first of all, thank you, thank you for having me uh, to part thank you for having me, you know, to part part partake in this event. And uh, I just want to say thank you to the rest of the panelists. Uh, it's really inspiring to listen to all of you, knowing that, you know, you guys have, you have great concerns for the ocean. And uh, yeah, just, I'm just really happy, glad that, glad that I was able to listen to your point of views and your point of view and everything else. Um, yeah, thank you for having me and yeah. Happy World Ocean Day, World Ocean Week. Thank you so much, Malaya, Vinaka. Uh, and over to Anto, please. Final comments? Uh, I just wanna uh, thank you so much for including me in this Tauna session. It's a bit cheesy to say, but I really do feel a deep connection to the sea. And it's hard to keep up my whole angsty teen, I hate the world <laughs> act when I'm at the ocean because it brings me peace. And it's, I'm glad to see a lot of people have the same respect and care for the ocean as I do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anto, Naka. And over to Nanuku. Uh, final comments from Varani Sese and Alusio, please. Yes. Just a reminder to all, uh, we should use uh, uh, the seminar. Uh, we will name it uh, Recycle, Refuse, Reduce, Reuse, re Repair. Recover, Regift, and Repair. Those are the seven R's, and we are hoping you can follow those seven R's. Happy World Ocean Day. Vinaka, thank you very much, Rani Sese and Alessio, for that great message. And finally, I will hand um, the mic over to Anne Mary if you can uh, for your final comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed um, all your inspiring messages and stories. I'd like to thank the organizers for hosting this Talana session. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, uh, my final message to everybody, I think it's about time that we young people uh, tell the government that if the development has a purpose, then we as human beings, we are able to live in peace with the ocean, with the environment. But if the development does not have any purpose at all, it will bring, it will bring destruction and in chaos as well and um and my, my my final message is that i'm happy to see that a lot of young people are now engaged in this youth movement calling on governments and adults of today telling them that we are cleaning up the mess that we did not create and we are fighting for a future thank you vinaka Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie, for that message of uh, resilience um, and uh, showing once again that our, our children and young people are ready to take on this fight to save our oceans and our environment. Um, you know, I have been so inspired this morning um, listening to you all share your perspectives, your, um, your views, your stories, your art, your poetry. Um, and I'm just so grateful that, um, that you participated with such an openness of heart and mind. Um, again, we cannot stress enough just how important your contribution to these kinds of spaces um, and conversations are. Um, it has been a real privilege for me to, um, to moderate this, 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 this panel discussion um, with such an amazing group of young people. Um, and I have learned um, so much just listening um, to each one of you um, share your perspectives um, on, World Ocean, on World Oceans Week. 
Um, it gives me, uh, as someone who is uh, older than you, than you all by quite a number of years, it really gives me hope for the future um, that, you know, as we continue to do the work that we do in our different positions, that following behind us are young people such as yourselves who are looking to us for examples, for positive examples, um, not only by speech, but also through the practicing, through our actions. And so that also gives, you know, the nation's lead, the Pacific region leaders, the, the church leaders, organization leaders to, it, it's also a call for them to remember that everything that we are doing, that they are doing, is being watched very carefully by your generation, by watchful eyes. And so I am so grateful that you have all agreed to partake in this Talanoa session with me. Thank you for your openness. Thank you for your participation, your contribution. Um, and, uh, and just from my side, a happy World Oceans Week um, from myself, my colleagues, and these wonderful young people who have shared their wisdom with us this morning. Vinakovakalevu. Uh,